My name is Ellie Cable and I'm the Facility Manager for Sydney Microscopy and Microanalysis. Today I'm giving you a lecture on the principles of fluorescence microscopy. Fluorescence can be found everywhere in the universe, but it is not at all commonplace. On this slide, we're looking at images of fluorescence objects. The first object is the horsehead nebula. The pink background is actually fluorescence from hydrogen. The actual shape of the horsehead is due to a dust cloud, which is actually obscuring the fluorescence. The second image is of the aurora borealis which some of you may have been lucky enough to see in person. The fluorescence here is coming from nitrogen and oxygen in the atmosphere. The third image is of a firefly. The fluorescence here is coming from luminol. The fourth image is of fluorescently stained cancer cells embedded in a collagen matrix. Both the aurora borealis and the firefly are easily seen by the naked eye. However, magnification techniques are necessary to see the nebula or the fluorescently stained cells. In the case of the nebula, it's a telescope, and in case, case of the fluorescently stained cells, it's an epifluorescence microscope. Until the late 1970s, the majority of biological light microscopy was on contrast techniques. The main reason for this was because of the introduction of the commercial epifluorescence microscope was not available until the late 1960s, early 70s. But you can see then there was an explosion of papers from the 90s onwards. This was due to the fact that that's when the first confocal microscope was available commercially. The confocal microscope is able to collect three-dimensional data and use multiple probes. This spurned a flurry of research to produce more fluorescence probes and advanced microscopy techniques. Now we have many advanced techniques such as multiphoton, total internal refraction, lifetime, just to name a few, and a huge number and variety of fluorescent probes. However, to be able to use these techniques, you need to understand fluorescence itself. For many hundreds of years, transmission light microscopy was used to observe biological specimens and a huge amount of scientific knowledge was gained. Today, the contrast techniques are still very valid and valuable as they contribute greatly to our health with pathologists using contrast stains like the example on this slide. However, as you can see in this comparison images, fluorescence vastly increases the sensitivity, allowing the more specific staining of proteins and organelles. The contrast techniques act by absorbing light, while in fluorescence, we collect emitted light. It is much easier to detect emission of light than absorption of light. A dark adapted human eye can detect a few tens of thousands of photons per second, but the same eye struggles to distinguish a 1% difference in absorption. To understand this, we first need to look at the properties of light. Light is a form of electromagnetic radiation consisting of an oscillating electric field with an oscillating magnetic field perpendicular to it. These oscillating fields behave like waves traveling at the speed of light. The wavelength of light is typically measured in nanometers. And this is a property that the fluorescence microscopist is interested in. The electromagnetic spectrum spans a very large range but we are interested in the visible range. This slide is actually depicting wavelength, frequency, energy, and wave number. As a biological microscopist, the most important function that we use is wavelength. If you're a physicist, you would be really interested in the frequency. The energy is also extremely interesting to us because you can see that at the UV area, we have a much higher energy this is important because the energy, if you're putting it into your sample, you're possibly causing bond breaks if you're putting in too much light. Now let's examine that further. Here, we're investigating the visible spectrum. You're seeing great differences between the 400 and 700 nanometer light. At the 400 nanometer end, we've got a shorter wavelength, a higher frequency, 
and a higher energy. With this shorter wavelength, you're actually going to have most of your specimen absorbing that light, even though it might not be emitting it. With the higher energy, you actually could be causing bond break. So it's very important to think about this if you're doing live cell experiments. This wavelength could be causing toxicity to your specimens and you might be killing your cells. In the infrared area, you have a longer wavelength, a lower frequency and a lower energy. With the longer wavelength, you'll have lots less non-specific absorption. Therefore, the wavelength is able to travel deeper into your specimen and you will be able to get much more information out of the depth of that experiment. However, it has less resolution. The combination of all these wavelengths together is seen as white light. To demonstrate this, we can look at some images where I've had some fun playing. The thing one does when you're working from home. In the first image here, you're actually seeing an actual spectrum of light on a CD. What I've done here is shine a white light torch onto the CD. This is obvious when I'm looking at the grating in the second image and the light is separated into its various colours on the ceiling. Taking this, you can see the rainbow of colours that you would get across a visible spectrum. Have a play yourself. You can actually sometimes see this with the sun refracting through the glass in the windows in your house. As was discussed before, in contrast techniques, it's absorption of light and fluorescence is emission. Let's use another demonstration to illustrate this. First, let's look at absorption. Here we have four solutions. A rhodamine 6G dye solution, a solution of red food colouring, some hand sanitizer, and tonic water. Now let's examine what happens when we shine white light from a torch on the red food colouring sample. You can see here that you have red light transmitted through the sample. If we now do the same thing to the rhodamine solution, we're actually seeing a pink light in the background. This is actually red and blue light being transmitted through the sample and all of the other light being absorbed. When we actually look at white light shining on the tonic water and the hand sanitizer, we actually seem to see light transmitted through. We're only seeing some little bit of reflection of the white light from the glass or the sample, but we're not seeing any of the colour being absorbed. So let's examine this further. When we look from above onto the red food colouring, we can only see red light being transmitted through the sample and it actually only seems to be reflected slightly on the sides. However, if we're looking at the rhodamine 6G solution, you're seeing that we're actually having light transmitted through but you're seeing green yellow fluorescence in the middle of the sample. So this sample is both absorbing the light and also fluorescing. The white light from this torch is not particularly strong and it contains the full vis visible spectrum. Let us now investigate if we actually illuminate these different solutions with this particular strong wavelength of light. In this slide, we're exciting the solutions with 366 nanometer light from an ultraviolet lamp source. You can see the food colouring seems just to absorb this light. Whereas if we're looking at the three other solutions, we're seeing a beautiful fluorescence from the tonic water, the hand sanitizer, and a lovely yellow fluorescence from the rhodamine. See if you can identify what molecules are in the tonic water and the hand sanitizer that be could be causing this fluorescence. The solutions you have seen so far have been fluorescing in the violet and yellow, but there are many fluorescence molecules, and this image is just displaying some of the range of colours. So you can imagine how pretty your specimens can be if you're able to label different parts of your specimen with a variety of probes. Some people have used up to eight different probes. This is incredibly hard to prepare, but you'll learn about specimen preparation in future lectures. So let us examine what is the actual process that occurs in fluorescence. First, we have absorption. In this image, you're seeing the actual white light shining on the rhodamine 6G, and you have both absorption and fluorescence occurring. 
On the right hand side, we're looking at the absorbance curve of rhodamine 6G. You will note that it has a major peak at about 530, but it's also absorbing in about the 350, 360 area, possibly 280 and about 250. As you saw previously, the light we illuminated the rhodamine solution with was 366 nanometers. If you're looking at the absorption curve, you'll see that this is right on the edge of one of the absorption peaks. The molecules are still able to absorb this light and fluoresce in the yellow-green. Here we can now see the emission curve overlaid on the absorption curve. The maximum emission is 552, the maximum absorption is at 530. The actual image is coming from when we excited it at 366. Note how the emission curve overlaps the absorption curve. This is very important to know for all of your molecules and we will address how we can separate this when we look at filters. We now know that all molecules absorb light but not all emit. But how does this happen? Energy can be stored, absorbed in a molecule in many different ways. Absorption in the microwave is due to molecular rotations. Absorption in the infrared is due to molecular vibrations. Absorption of UV visible light is due to electrons in the molecule being promoted to higher states. To illustrate this, I will use a diagrammatic cartoon called a Jablonski diagram. This diagram is representative of energy levels and loss. The thicker lines are the electronic states. Here we're seeing the S0 gram state and the S1 excited state. The thinner lines are representing the vibrational state. A molecule rests in the S0 or ground state. In this next slide, you're actually seeing how you have the absorption going from the S0 through to the vibrational states above the S1 that they lose energy and rattle down to S1 and then from the S1 state, they go all the way down to S0, emitting light. You will note that there's different color lines here, and you'll see that the shorter wavelengths, i.e. those that are closer to the ultraviolet, actually have more energy and are actually exciting your molecule to a higher vibrational level. But you'll also notice that all of that energy always comes back to the S1 state, and that you have emission from there down to S0. So let's actually investigate that a little further with a few more cartoons. In this slide, you'll see that your, your fluorophore or molecule is at the ground state. So from the ground state, you apply energy in the form of light. Your molecule then is excited from the ground state to an excited vibrational state. From that vibrational state, it will actually start to lose energy. Once it has gone lost energy, it will actually move down and emit light. You'll note here that the lifetime of a fluorophore is 10 to the minus 12 to 10 to the minus 9 seconds. This lifetime is very important for us and it's something that we're able to measure in different experiments. It also means a single fluorophore can be continually excited. This slide is once again illustrating that no matter where your molecule absorbs the light, it will always have the same mission profile. So when you look at this and look at the excitation with D, you'll see that the profile is much smaller than the excitation with B. You also see this on the Jablonski diagram, that if you're actually exciting with a bluer dye or further into the UV, your molecule gets excited to a higher vibrational level. However, what will happen here is it will actually lose more energy, which could be in heat, down to the, the S1 electronic state. Then the light is emitted in fluorescence. Let us examine this with another cartoon. In this slide, you can see the absorption curve for a specific molecule. If you're exciting at 480, you'll notice in the diagram that only a few molecules are being lit up or being excited. If you actually go and excite at 500 nanometers, more molecules are being excited. And if you actually go to the maximum of 550, you will see more molecules are being excited or absorbing the light. Therefore, you really would like to be actually 
exciting your molecule at the maximum absorbance. This may not always be possible. It will depend on the actual light or laser lines that you have available to you. If we now look at the emission curve of various dyes, you can see that they vary greatly. So while the emission curve of a particular dye will always be exactly the same, no matter where you excite it, having different emissions means that we're able to label our specimens with multiple probes and selectively, selectively collect the emission. As you have observed previously, the absorption and fluorescence or absorption and emission curves of molecules can overlap greatly. In this example, we're showing two different fluorophores which have completely different profiles. You will note that the, the maximum absorption and emission of one is inc incredibly close together, whereas the others are completely shifted apart. This distance is called the Stokes shift. It's a very important factor that we know what the Stokes shift is of every molecule. You would actually think that having a large Stokes shift so that your fluorescence profile is completely different from your absorption would be of great value. It is if you're able to collect it. However, having a large Stokes shift means you're also having a large energy loss. With a large energy loss, you're often generating heat. Generation of heat in your sample can be very detrimental, so it's often not a good thing to have. In summary then, when you're exciting your molecule, it's losing energy and it's emitting light, it continues to do this. So you have a cyclic process going from the ground state, absorbing the light, excitation and emitting. The efficiency of this process is called the quantum yield. A quantum yield of one is actually a rather great thing to have because this means that the amount of absorbed photons is equivalent to the amount of fluorescent photons. This is very unlikely thing to have. It is often good to have something which has a very good quantum yield, but it will depend on the fluorophores that you are able to use for the experiment you have. So far, we have only been discussing the process of fluorescence. However, in this region of the ultraviolet and visible light, when we're exciting our molecules, there are other interactions that can happen. This Jablonski diagram is giving us a representation of the other interactions that may occur. So here we have both intersystem crossing and internal conversion. While we have talked about the S0 and S1 electronic states, there's also what's known as the triplet state, which is diagrammatically represented here as T1. So here we have something that's called intersystem crossing. It is always possible when you actually have absorption of your molecule that you may force the molecule to actually go into what's known as a triplet state. A triplet state is very unstable and will react easily with another triplet. As it so happens, oxygen naturally occurs in triplet state. If oxygen is present, it will actually bind to your molecule. When this happens, it means that the molecule will no longer be able to fluoresce. If there is no oxygen present, it's also possible for the molecule to go into the triplet state, go down to T1, and then actually have phosphorescence. Phosphorescence is another process which occurs in seconds, as opposed to the very quick reaction of fluorescence. Phosphorescence is something you would need to be capturing for a long time, and it's not something that we would normally want to do in fluorescence microscopy. It's also possible for a molecule to absorb energy to go across to another vibrational state and to go all the way down to the ground state without fluorescing at all. And this is called internal conversion. The most common of these reactions that you may come across is actually the triplet-triplet oxygen reaction. Let me demonstrate this in the next slide. Here we have fluorescein stained actin and at time zero, we're just exciting it with its 488 light. At 10 seconds, you can see it's slightly dimmer. At 20 seconds, it's slightly dimmer again. And at 30 seconds, it seems to have completely disappeared. So what's happening here? If you look at the molecule on the bottom, you'll see that we have a vibrating molecule. And then it's vibrating so much, it's actually broken a bond. If you look at the last part of the diagram, you'll see this is represented by the molecule being in the ground state, 
cycling through, absorbing, and then we're going to a destructive pathway. This means that the molecule is no longer available to fluoresce. This is one of the most common problems we may face in fluorescence microscopy and will be discussed later in sample preparation and in imaging. I would now like to show you a demonstration. I'm going to take the tonic water that we had previously and separate it into two flasks. We will then excite both solutions with the 366 nanometer light as previously. I will now add about 2 grams of salt to one of the flasks. We will then mix this through by swirling and agitating and look at what happens. You will now see that we seem to have no fluorescence in the solution that's had the table salt added to it. Can you postulate what is happening here? What is the reaction and what is fluorescing? We will actually discuss this when we have our question and answer session. During this lecture, we have discussed that you need to know the full absorption and emission curves of your molecules. This slide is a demonstration of a variety of dye absorption emission curves. You can see that most of the dyes have an overlap in these curves. We also discussed the fact that the excitation light is much stronger than the emitted light, so we need to be able to detect the specific emission signal. To do that, we use filters. This beautiful image is of stained glass in the Sayes Cathedral. Colours you see are the transmitted light, just as the colour in the red food colouring was the transmitted light. The rest of the white light spectrum is absorbed by the glass. These traditional filters have been around for centuries. You will notice in the stained glass the many colours. The colour that's happening here, of course, is the absorbed colour and the rest of the white light, which is coming through from the sunshine, is passing through. However, in fluorescence, we need to be much more specific. The breakthrough came with the invention of dichroic mirrors. An interference or dichroic filter reflects some wavelengths while it passes others and they can be made extremely specific. In the example we have here, it's called a short pass filter. It's passing short wavelengths and absorbing or reflecting long wavelengths. And it's specifically around the 560 short pass. You will note, however, that this cutoff is not exactly at 560. In fact, you will still have light being allowed through from approximately 510 to 610. The next example is of a long pass filter. It's absorbing or reflecting short wavelength and it's passing the long wavelength. Once again, you have a cutoff at 570 nanometers, but this is also around about 100 nanometer wide and you have to account for that. If we're looking at this example, you're actually seeing white light coming through a filter where it's allowing to transmit the red up to 600 and it's blocking out the light below 600 nanometers. Another type of filter is called a bandpass filter. The bandpass with this filter is a 520 slash 100. That means it's centered at 520 with 100 nanometer width. So it's going from 470 nanometers to 570 nanometers. This is actually quite wide and they can be made much more specific. In the example here, you can actually see how we're actually just collecting that transmitted light from about 510 to about 560. Let us examine using these filters with an actual specimen. In the example here, you can see that we have a very blurry image. We've got the excitation light and the emission light overlapping each other. If we put in a filter which cuts out the excitation light, you see a crisp, clear image of the stained actin fibres. And this is by using a long pass filter so that you're only allowing the excitation light to come through. That's a very simple example. Now let's look at a double stain. Here once again, you're seeing some actually nice fluorescence, 
but it is not crisp and quite blurry and hard to see any detail. If we now go and actually just pick up a certain amount of each of the transmitted light, and this is actually the emission light that's being transmitted to your eyes, we have a much crisp, clearer image. These are quite simple examples. In the actual microscope lecture, you will be shown how you can combine these filters so that you can image multiple floor floors. You will have a filter block which will contain bandpass filters, short and long pass filters all in one. To summarise some of the important points that you should take from this lecture is that everything absorbs, but not everything fluoresces. It is important to know the full absorption emission curve of your dyes. It is also important to know the intrinsic fluorescence of your sample. The next step is to understand the equipment you have available for you to use. The lecture, The Complete Microscope, will help with that. Specimen preparation is critical. As we often say, garbage in is garbage out. Two lectures are dedicated to this. I would like to thank all the people on this slide for academic and technical input and supplying images.